Happy Sabbath, church. Happy Sabbath. Sorry, I was sitting in the back, relaxed. I still thought there's going to be a children's story. <laughs> and We're running out of time, sorry. Okay, so we are looking at 12.30 now. How long have I got? Two hours. Two hours? <laughs> Chris says two hours. Everyone happy with that? We like to listen to you. Yeah. <laughs> I promise I won't keep you here two hours, by the grace of God. Let me just put my phone on silent so we don't get any disturbances. And I can keep track of time as well. So happy Sabbath again, church. Happy Sabbath. I see lots of new faces. I hope you didn't come and listen to me. Because you'll be bored. I hope you came to hear God's word. We're not going to have a sermon today. We're going to have something what we call is a Bible study. Now can I just ask, how many uh, visitors here today? Okay. Good. Welcome. Because I used to be a visitor here on my first visit. But within the first hour I became a member. So if you've been here longer than an hour, you're no longer a visitor. So make yourself at home. Alright? Okay. So today we're going to be looking at the life of a deeper look into the life of Jacob. A deeper look into the life of Jacob. But before I go into the main sermon or the study that we're going to be doing, we're going to have a quick word of prayer. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, our prayer is simple. We lift it up to the Most High and we say, Lord, bless us to understand your word as we spend time discussing your holy scriptures at this time. Let your Holy Spirit's presence be here. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. 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 Before I go in, I'm, I'm going to ask some questions. Dreams. How many of you have dreams? We all dream, right? Good. In the daytime or at nighttime? Nighttime. How many daydream? <laughs> Amen. It's good because, listen, Joseph daydreamed some of the times. And look how many dreams came true. Right? So never give up on dreams. But let me turn around and share with you something about dreams. God will give you a dream sometimes that you have to ponder and think upon in a deeper way. Sometimes you'll have dreams that will not make sense. But don't let go of them. First consider your diet. If you've had lots of cheese, then you can discount that dream. Right? Yes. But if you're keeping your body in a healthy, happy state, and you go to bed at night, you see a dream, don't let it trouble you. Because God has a meaning behind it. You know, I have, I have something to share. Is, um, it's about life. Life is short. And life can be sweet. But life is short and we can also make it bitter. But God wants us to live a life, whether it's long or short, that we can live it in sweetness and happiness. Because he wants us to share the sunshine that he's given us. I remember it's just a couple of weeks ago, it's just over eight weeks ago, we was in Malta, we was driving on the island, and we was driving on the island, everything's good. Where we're rushing to catch a boat one of the mornings and we're just heading down the road. And as we're heading down the road, we come to this point where it's a slight incline, decline, sorry, to the road. And we're driving and we see a man, I see a man eating a sandwich. And he's on the edge of the road. And as he's on the edge of the road, he takes one step and I start slowing down. And I'm like, surely this man must know there's traffic coming from this side. So as he steps, he stops. So I'm coming from his right. He's looking to the left, eating his sandwich. Like this. And I'm looking, I'm calculating his moves. And I'm, I, I'm, like, I'm like, where's he going? What's he doing? I'm still driving. I'm getting closer to him. And as we get close to him, guess what he does? He takes two more steps and... I slam the brakes, the man's lying on my bonnet. He gets up, he, he limps, he stares at me, and I'm staring at him, and I'm like, I'm like, man, I'm, I'm, I'm in a country, I don't even know what the rules are here. And he looks at me, he says, he says, it's my fault, I'm okay. 
and I, and I put the window down. I says, are you sure you're okay? Because I'm rushing for a ferry. Do you want me to come out? He says, no, 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 go, go. I says, are you sure? And he says, yeah, sure, go. And I drive on and for days, it stuck in my mind. And I was like, I says, man, I says, I hope the brother's okay. I should have stopped and stepped out of the car and prayed with him. So it disturbed me a little. And then I remember days later when we came back, I had a dream and I'm, and in the dream I'm driving but I'm focusing on something to my right. This man was to my left when he was driving. Heading up, he was to the left side, he fell on the passenger side of the bonnet. Days later I dream and I'm dreaming this dream and, I, and you know what, this dream scared me. It put fear inside my bones. Because while I'm seeing the dream, it's like I'm focusing on something to my right. And guess what? Right under my bumper is a child. And I look at the dream and it's like, and, and it scared me because it's like, the last thing you want to do is run someone over in life. With a physical car. Even though we run one another down with our words at times. So I look at the dream and I was like, oh, man, I said, what is it? So I go to work and a couple of colleagues were like, hey, how's things? I said, yeah, things were good. They said, how's your holiday? I said, my holiday was good, you know, and this is what happened. You know, a man walk out in front of the car and I knock him. There's no damage to the car. He, he said his leg was okay. He was just, he was just hurt a little. And, and I was like, I said, and you know what? I had a dream. I was driving and I was looking at something to the right and my focus was not on the road. And next thing I know, there was a child that was laying in front of my bumper. And my friend looked at me and she laughed. She's not a believer. So she was just like, Rick, whatever man, you must have had a heavy night. And I was like, no, I said I didn't. So, time goes on, I forget the dream. And then last Sunday is when I had an experience that God showed me as to what he was exactly pointing at. And the thing he's pointing at is, one thing is we have to be aware on the roads. We come back, we've, we've, we've had an amazing day down in, uh, around Bracknell. We're driving back, we come back home. I'm supposed to go pick up some wood from Swindon. I jump in the car and I'm driving, it's 10 o'clock at night. As I'm belting down the road, I'm just, I'm, I'm doing 70, 75, I'm, and then I'm slowing down a little and I'm like, road is clear, it's night, I need to get there, I need to pick up the wood, I need to come back. I'm zooming away and as I'm belting it down the A350, I'm coming up the lake up, I see a car pulling out over 200 meters away. It pulls out and I'm like, ah, oh, this car's going to slow me down. And then the car stops. And as the car stops... It has the lights go on, but it's still facing this way on the road. And I'm like, the car stopped, my way is clear. And guess what? From 50, I'm picking up my speed again, going up to 70 again. And as I get closer to the car, the car was to my right hand side, and I'm focusing on the car, I'm not focusing on the road. Suddenly, I see something on the road, I have to slam my brakes. The car had just knocked a biker off his bike, so they blocked his way, the biker hit into them, he flew onto my side of the road, he was there in black, it's a road which has no lights, and the man's on my side of the lane, and you know what, till now, I seriously don't know how the Lord let my brakes work so well that I stopped literally five meters away from the man's legs from running him over. What's God trying to say? He's trying to say, slow down, people. He's trying to say, if you're driving on the roads, think of others. You know, I don't think I would have lived with the conscience of knowing I ran the man over. And the worst thing was, the man died on the spot. We checked his pulse. We tried everything. We tried speaking to him. There's nothing. The man was dead. And my legs were shaking because I was thinking, I says, man, I would have just gone over his legs and I would have to take the hit for the blame 
of the man's death. God's saying, slow down. He's showing us things through our dreams. He's trying to communicate to us. And now, let me turn around and reassure you this one thing. I am not a perfect man. Did you hear that? I am not a perfect man. I'm not so godly that I'm holier than thou. I am but just a simple human like yourselves. I make mistakes in the week. I fall short of God's glory. I can sin. I can get angry. I'm not trying to say that God is only giving me dreams to tell me what's going to take place in my life, but I'm trying to tell you that if no matter what your walk is like with God, try to have a closer walk with Him so that He can show you things to come. God knows that if I'd run the man's legs over, my conscience would have been troubled for weeks. But you know one thing that also reassured me something? That our life is so short that it can go like this in seconds. From me belting the 70 to stopping at the man's feet and his breath going from his body was, was only a matter of I'd say about 10 to 12 seconds. How short is your life? That it cannot be taken just like this. And you know, it's funny how we sometimes uplift ourselves and think like we've got forever to live. We've got no God to answer to. We live our lives as though there was a guarantee tomorrow, the day after, the week after, the month after, and years after. And here lay this man in front of me. Paramedics tried everything. They had to pronounce him dead on the sea. And I looked and I stood there and I thought about the young men who would literally not focus on the road. Three of them, they must, maybe they were having fun. Maybe they're enjoying themselves. He came to the junction, didn't bother, properly looking to the right, just pulled out, bike of smacks, smacks right in the side of his car. God's trying to say we need to look left, right, and center. If we fail to pay attention to small details, we can cost us our lives, and we can cost the lives of others. So if there's anything I want you to take away with you today, is take consideration of where God is leading you, and how you're allowing yourself to be led by God, and make sure that you're looking out for the lives of others, and looking out for the lives of your own. Should we go into our study now? Can, can I close? No? No, no. Okay. So, the life of Jacob. So, our brother Emmanuel read from Genesis chapter 33, 32, sorry. It says, and he rose up that night and took his two wives, verse 22. Well, we will start from uh, verse 25. And verse 24, sorry. And Jacob was left alone, and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go for the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. And he said unto him, what is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, thy name shall be called no more Jacob but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men and hast prevailed. And Jacob asked him and said, tell me I pray thee thy name. And he said, wherefore is it that thou dost ask after my name? And he blessed him there. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel. For I have seen God face to face. And my life is preserved. If I were to turn around and ask you today. If I was to mention the name Jacob. What comes to your mind? What's the first thing that comes to your mind? 
A cheater of his brother? Right? Okay. What else comes to your mind? So, sorry? The ladder. Oh. The ladder. The ladder? Okay, that's good. I heard someone else on this side. The father of Joseph. The father of Joseph, okay, that's good. But what is the main thing that we know Jacob as? He had 12 sons who became the 12 tribes of Israel. He was the father of the 12 sons who became the 12 tribes of Israel. Now I asked the same question at a church last Sabbath. And guess what most of the people said? The very first answer that I got from the crowd. A deceiver and a cheater. Right? Everyone agree with me? Not throughout his whole life. Sorry? He wasn't that throughout his whole life. No, he wasn't. In fact, guess what? In his life he was that, but for only a short period of time. We're going to look at the life of Jacob today. There's one person who's already heard this sermon. So Paul, you won't get any prizes for answering all the questions. <laughs> but I might let you have a free drink. <laughs> Good to see you, man. So the life of Jacob, but before we can go into the life of Jacob and this instance that we're looking at here in Genesis chapter 32, we need to backtrack a little. Jacob is known in the majority of Christianity for his deception. But you know, the further I looked into the life of Jacob up until recently, I found out that, you know what, he had only but deceived for one hour in the majority of his life. But yet we've branded Jacob with this big stamp saying deceiver, liar, conniving, trickster. That is the title that has been given to him. But we need to today look and find out. Jacob's father. Who was Jacob's father? Children. Who was Jacob's dad? That was his grandfather. I hear the big children talking, but the little ones I can't hear. Isaac. And who was his mom? Rebecca, so good. There's a child there who's studying the Bible. <laughs> Amen. Keep it up, parents. <laughs> so, Isaac and Rebecca. Who was his grandfather? Abraham. Was Abraham a deceiver? No. Did he deceive? Yes. yes. He did, right? Yes. And how is it we call him the father of faith, but he, pr he practiced deception as well, especially to a big grown up king? Isaac. Was Isaac a deceiver? Yes. He was, right? Yeah. How come we don't call him the deceiver? How many times did he, did he fool people that his wife was his sister? Once or was it twice? Twice, right? Okay. So, Jacob. Who did Jacob deceive? He deceived his father, right? Is within the household. What led Jacob to deceive his father? His mother. What else? Okay, he wanted the birthright. So he one a he wanted the birthright to his mother. What else shaped him? So if we were to turn around and look today at the book Patriots and Prophets, those of you who don't have a copy, please get this book. It's an amazing book. In fact, get the whole set. Patriots and Prophets, Prophets and Kings. Acts of the Apostles, Desire of Ages, Great Controversy. Right. <coughs> and you can throw in Steps to Christ as well. I think there's copies out there. So, someone's going to have to rush for their copies. Is there plenty more out there? Or? Yeah. Yes, there is, yeah? Okay, good. So, there's plenty of stock, so feel free. So, if we want to turn around and look. So, we're going to take some statements out of um, the book, Patriots and Prophets. First thing first is let's turn around and find out something about the birthright. The birthright was something that was promised. So there's a promise that was given on to Abraham. 
Abraham achieved that promise, but it wasn't fully accomplished in Abraham's lifetime because he gave, he brought forth a son Isaac, right? But within this blessing was supposed to be a blessing where when Christ came unto Abraham in, in the plains of Mamre, he says, For I will return unto thee according to the time of life, and thou shalt have a son. Right? And remember what I've previously shared with you. When Christ came and appeared, and remember it's the three beings that appeared on the plains. Abraham bowed himself down and he worshipped. When he worshipped, if all three of them were angels, what would the angels have turned around and told Abraham? Gabriel. Okay, so one of them was Gabriel, you think? Okay, good. Right? Maybe. We don't know. <laughs> if if the, all three of them were angels, the angels would have turned around and rebuked Abraham and said, Bow not down to me, for I am but a servant of God like thee. Remember John in the book of Revelation? He bows to an angel and the angel lifts him up. He says, I am of thy brethren who have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Right? So, but of the three beings that approach Abraham, Abraham bows himself and worships and calls him my Lord. Now when God presents himself on the face of this earth, he does not hold back from being worshipped. And when Christ turns around and says unto him that, you know, for I will return unto thee according to the time of life. Remember, Ab Christ didn't live according to the time of life. He was eternal, right? When he appeared to Abraham on the plains of Mamre. But he says, I return unto thee according to the time of life, meaning within the lifespan of a human being. Not in the lifespan of a divine being, but in the lifespan of a human being. So certain promises have been made and Abraham had understood that in the one who maintains and holds the birthright comes also a blessing of the Messiah coming through their lineage. The same promise that was made to Adam and to Eve. Saying, for what? For there'll be envy between my seed and the serpent. Right? So there was a promise. And Isaac had understood this promise that something is going to come through his lineage. That is going to be for the Messiah. And as he passes the birthright, and he has to pass the birthright on down. He is looking gloriously to the fact that someone through his lineage will be the saviour. Of mankind. Is that making sense? And it continues to say in the book, Patriots and Prophecies, it says, The promises made to Abraham and confirmed to his son were held by Isaac and Rebekah as a great object of their desires and hopes. And with these promises, Esau and Jacob were familiar. They were taught to regard the birthright as a matter of great importance, for included not only an inheritance of worldly wealth, but spiritual preeminence. He who received it was to be the priest of his family and in the line of his posterity, the redeemer of the world would come. So they look at it and they're like, yes, whoever gets it. But guess what? Isaac knew about this promise. Rebecca knew about this promise. But guess what? They both shaped their son to come to the point in his life where he would be nicknamed the deceiver. Did you know that? Let me turn around and read you a couple, one more statement. It says, Rebecca remembered the words of the angel and she read with clearer insight than did her husband the character of their sons. She was convinced that the heritage of divine promise was intended for Jacob. She repeated to Isaac the angel's words, but the father's affections were centered upon the elder son, and he was unshaken in his purpose. What were the words of the angel? That the older shall serve the younger. Right? Who was the older? Esau came out first from the womb, and then he was followed by Jacob, who was holding on to him, right? And he came forth. But you know, here was Isaac, a man who had seen great things that God had done for his father, 
and for him. But yet, his mind was fixed upon Esau. He continues to say that years passed on until Isaac, old and blind and expecting soon, to die determined no longer to de delay the bestowal of the blessing upon his elder son, but knowing the opposition of Rebekah and Jacob, he decided to perform the solemn ceremony in secret. In accordance with the custom of making a feast upon such occasions, a patriarch bade Esau, go out to the field and take me some venison and make me savory meat that my soul may bless thee before I die. Men, when God reveals to us his will, we stick in stubbornness. Women, when we know the will of God and we can clearly perceive things, we take things into our own hands. Who is the bigger one to blame out the father and the mother? Both of them. They both were men and women of God and they both shaped the destiny of their child to be nicknamed the deceiver up until our time today. Isaac knowing that such an incident for the bestowal of the birthright was to be a well-known incident, a, a feast, a ceremony, he decides to do it in secret. Because you know what? Sometimes women nag us so hard that we want to do things in secret. We agree to that? Am I the only one who's going to get stoned after the sermon? <laughs> right? And women, you're not wrong in telling us and trying to convince us what we're doing is wrong. Sometimes as men, we just have our own little stubborn way where we're like, you know something, I'm going to do it my way and not your way. And then the women are like, right, okay, I'm going to get even. I'm going to turn around and get one card over him. And then, Rebecca comes to Jacob and explains to him, saying, you need to deceive your dad in order to get this. Women, when God gives you that insight that your husband's in the wrong, please, prayerfully, pray and give it back into God's hands. That His will be done, even though you know what is right. Don't take it into your own hands to create something that will be deception. See, Rebecca had an example to learn from, but she hadn't learned from that example. Who was her example? Abraham's very own wife, Sarah. I will bless thee with sons. I will bless thee with land. We can't have a child. I'm too old. Here, here's Hagar. Here's my handmaiden. And then it turns to chaos that Abraham has to send Hagar and Ishmael away. Sarah heard those blessings while they were in the tents of Mamre. When Christ turned around and the angels turned around and says, Wherefore did your wife laugh? And she turned around and she says, I didn't laugh. The tent was a little distance away. It's not that she, she, she laughed that loudly. She just chuckled under her breath and Christ heard it while he was pronouncing the blessing upon Abraham. She heard it, but guess what? How can I have a child? And yet she gave Hagar to be the handmaiden. Created nothing but trouble. Rebecca had an example and she should have followed the example and turned around and says, I have seen the example of my mother-in-law and the mistake she made, I need to abstain. So sisters, don't take God's work into your hands, even though God and His angel may have spoken clearly to you. It continues to say as they, Rebecca kept on teaching and talking to Isaac about the birthright. And it says, with secret longing, he listened to all that his father told concerning the spiritual birthright. He carefully treasured what he had learned from his mother. Day and night, the object, the subject occupied his thoughts until it became the absorbing interest of his life. But while he thus esteemed it eternal, 
above temporal blessings, Jacob had not an experimental knowledge of the God whom he revered. His heart had not been renewed by divine grace. But he was willing to receive this birthright. He was willing that by the grace of God, he would be able to get this birthright that was promised to him that his mother had said that the angel had promised that he would be served by his older brother. But guess what? Rebecca sees, Spirit of Prophecy says, Rebecca divined his purpose and she was confident that it was contrary to what had God had revealed as his will. At this point, she had divined and the Spirit had impressed her. What Isaac was about to do was wrong. And guess what? If God has pronounced a certain blessing, and he turns around and says, A will serve B, and you're starting to see A being bestowed with the crown of authority, do you go out to fight it? Or do you turn around and say, Lord, your word said so, now fulfill your word. Or do you say, let's go out on the streets and riot, that A will not get the throne? Which one would you pick? The first. The first? Praying. Sorry? Praying. Praying and committing it to God, right? Yes. Good. That's what we should do. We can't take things into our own hands. It says... Jacob and Rebecca succeeded in their purpose, but they gained only trouble and sorrow by their deception. God had declared that Jacob should receive the birthright and his word would have been fulfilled in his own time had they waited in faith for him to work for them. But like many who now profess to be children of God, they are unwilling to leave the matter in God's hands. Prophecy also goes on to turn around and say that Jacob was not willing to go along with Rebecca's plans in the beginning. But finally he was convinced and he gave in. So if he was such a deceiver, would he know I've just jumped to the occasion straight away and say, all right, I'll deceive Isaac. All right, I'll go and get the blessing. But yet, we named this young man the deceiver. And guess what? How long do you reckon it took for Jacob to, and Rebecca to deceive Isaac? How long? A few hours. A few hours? Listen to what Spirit of Prophecy says. It says, in one short hour, he had made himself a work for a life wrong repentance so one thing I can guess is Rebecca must have been a good cook because she had the lamb trimmed skimmed everything boiled flavored and Jacob had to go in there and within 10 minutes of presenting the food he got the blessing so within that one hour of him accepting Bringing the lamb, going in, fooling his dad, getting the blessing, and walking out was one short hour. How many of us make decisions within minutes, seconds, within less than an hour, that we're still living with as a repentance in our life? How many? We are? We make mistakes. I live with some of my mistakes from my childhood till today. They come, they, they flash in my mind, and sometimes I have to really sit down and, boy, offer some extra prayers of repentance to the Lord for the mistakes I have made. So young people who are sitting in here today, make sure you wisely think. You don't want to get to my age and start losing your hair because of mistakes you made in the past. Because they follow you, they haunt you. Sometimes Satan brings you those memories back over and over. So he can kick you in the ground, on the dust, so you can lay there. 
And guess what? Many a times, those moments and mistakes you've made in the past come to you just prior to moments when you're supposed to make some very big decisions in your life that would help you fulfill a purpose that God has in your life for you. That's when Satan comes flowing in with all your mistakes. And how, you know how you feel? Sometimes I feel so weak. I can't even... I just need to go get, find a bed or somewhere to lay down and I need to sleep. That's how bad it gets sometimes. And when I'm refreshed and, I'm t and I'm, I wake up and I'm like, Lord, I place those things be behind me. How is it they're constantly before me? Guess who is the accused of the brethren? It's not Boris Johnson. <laughs> it's Satan himself. Satan is the one who comes and presents your mistakes before you and the lifelong repentance that Jacob had to live with was to try to make a fix and a correction to the things that he had done in that one short hour. When Jacob received the birth, when he exchanged, when he made the, the initial deal prior to receiving it, remember Esau comes back from the field? Esau's tired, he hasn't had a hunt, he's, he's at a failed mission, and what does he do? He turns around and comes to Jacob, he says, listen, let me have some of your porridge, or your soup, or your lentils, right? And what does Jacob say? No. And, and Esau's like, listen, please, lest I die. And Jacob's like, alright, you can have it on one condition. Give me your birthright. Did Esau regard the birthright as a high and mighty thing? No. It says Esau grew up loving self-gratification and centering all his interests in the present. Impatient of restraint, he delighted in the wild freedom of the chase and early chose the life of a hunter. Yet he was the father's favorite. The quiet, peace-loving shepherd was attracted by the daring and vigor of his, their elder son who fearlessly ranged over mountains and desert, returning home with game for his father and with exciting accounts of his adventurous life. Jacob, thoughtful, diligent, and caretaking, ever thinking more of the future than the present, was content to dwell at home. Occupied in the care of the flocks and the tillage of the soil, his patient perseverance, thrift, and foresight were valued by the mother. His affections were deep and strong, and his gentle, unremitting attentions added far more to the happiness then did the boisterous and occasional kindness of Esau to Rebecca, Jacob was a dearer son. Because of his indifference to the divine blessing and requirements, Esau is called in the scripture a profane person. He represents those who lightly value the redemption purchased for them by Christ and are ready to sacrifice their airship to heaven for the perishable things of this earth. How many times are we like that? Brothers and sisters, I will turn around and ask you a question today. Are you a Jacob? Or are you an Esau? Or are you an Israel? Or are you an Esau? Which one are you? If you're an Esau and you have sacrificed your heirship to the throne by worldly things, then please check your track again today. Spend some more time with God. Because those worldly things, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness and all these other things that men and women are running after shall be added unto you. Has God not promised that? So if he's made you a promise, why are you trying to chase the things of the world first before you chase God's kindness, his love and his righteousness? We have a fix to apply to our spiritual systems today. We have a fix. Esau had disregarded the birthright and he was called a profane man. Jacob wanted it and guess what Spirit Prophecy also says? After Isaac blessed Jacob and he realized what had happened, it says trembling with astonishment and distress, the blind old father leaned, learned the deception that had been practiced upon him. His long and fondly cherished hopes had been thwarted. What was his long and fondly cherished hopes? 
that Esau may receive the birthright. And he keenly felt the disappointment that must come upon his eldest son. Yet the conviction flashed upon him that it was God's providence which had defeated his purpose and brought about the very thing he had determined to prevent. You know how patient and kind God is? You know God would have, God would have given Isaac two hits for trying to dis, you know, go against God's plans. But God was still kind and loving. He remembered the words of the angel to Rebekah and notwithstanding the sin of which Jacob was now guilty, he saw in him the one best fitted to accomplish the purposes of God. Here was Jacob again, brothers and sisters, surrounded by a father who was stubborn and stuck in his ways and he wanted to bless the older son. Here was a mother who had turned around and determined and says, listen, I don't care what the angel said. I don't care what God said. I'm going to take things into my own hands. And son, this is what you're going to do. Get me the lamp. You deceive your dad. Tie some skin on your arms. Go and deceive your father and get that birthright. But guess what? That wasn't it. Have you ever wondered where Rebecca got a tricking, knivery, lying spirit from? Have you ever wondered? Her own father? Okay. It wasn't a father. It, 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 it ran in the family. It was more, I'd say, it must be in the fathers because the parents passed it down to the children. Because remember, Jacob flees to the land of her family, right? And guess who meets him there? Laban. Does Laban treat him nice? Initially. Initially. And then... He turns around to Jacob and he says, he says, you know, Jacob, you know, it's like, since you're part of my, you know, I'm part of your kinsman and you're part of my kinsman from my sister's side, um, for, uh, sorry, from, yes, from my sister's side, that's it, from his sister's side, right? And he says, come, you know, I can't let you work for free. What would you want to work for? Jacob, what does Jacob ask? He asks for Rachel, right? And guess what? Here comes trickery once again. For a young man who's trying to live an honest life, who's trying to repent of his wrong one-hour mistakes that he made, right? He gets fooled again. This time, it's by the mother's own brother. I'll give you a wife. Yay! Ceremony. Honeymoon. Wake up in the morning. Guess what? It's not the woman he wanted to marry. It's her sister. So you could see that there was a certain amount of trickery that ran in Rebecca's side of the family. But yet this young man gets named until today in society when we turn around and say, what do we know about Jacob? Jacob was a trickster, a liar, and a deceiver. We never call Laban a liar. We never call Rebecca a liar. But Jacob is known for it. Jacob is known for it. He undergoes these situations and in closing, I see it's 10 past 1, I'll be closing shortly, is where we now come to Genesis chapter 32. Jacob has had enough. And guess what? Another thing is, when you practice deception, you pay a price. His mom practiced deception and tried to get the son to deceive the father, which worked. Guess what? The price she paid was that she was never to see the face of her son ever again. She died while he was in exile. He couldn't see his mother again because he was fearful to come back to Esau and the wrath and anger of Esau. But while he won, he's, he's had enough of 14 years of laboring in Laban's fields, looking after his flock of sheep, it turned out to be that the blessings that God was giving Jacob because God was kind and patient. Even in Jacob's exile, God straight away through mercy shows him the vision of the ladder that uh, Brother Sorin had mentioned. If he was such a bad deceiver, why would God give him such a beautiful vision? Sometimes circumstances get men and women in places where in society, we can brandish them the biggest threat, big, I don't know, we can give them names. You 
we fail to mention some crimes in, in, in church here today, we'd be like, oh yeah, that person's one, that person's one. You know, when, in society, when people like that turn up and we look at them and we're like, wow, that person, man, he, he deserves to be chopped out of society. You know what, we, what we're doing? When we turn around and point the finger at someone and turn around and say, that person killed, did this, and right? We haven't even taken the time to understand what circumstances led that person to do what they did back when they did it. Does that make sense? Try to consider people's circumstances. It's not that people overnight just turn around and decide that they want to do what they want to do. There's got to be something playing on their minds. And guess what? In every act those people have taken, those classes that we can place in society and we can ostracize them, every single one of them has a Satan who has put them in the position that they're in today. Brothers and sisters, we are not exempt from Satan and his ways. We are not. And we have to be careful lest we turn around and let the same Satan who's placed those people in that situation place us in a situation where we're trying to draw a barrier between us and them. And he is winning on both sides. He's, he's, he's kicking the ball on Man U side and he's kicking the ball on the Chelsea side. And guess what? No matter which side wins, who gets the trophy? Not the football club. Who gets it? Satan, right? Because he exalts in what he brings about. Jacob crosses the brook and he turns around and he's like, I'm going to touch just two points and then I promise I'll be closing. Are you all still with me? Yeah. Okay. And when he saw he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go for the day break it. And he said, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. And he said unto him, what is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, thy name shall be called no more Jacob but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men and hast prevailed. And Jacob asked him and said, tell me, I pray thee thy name. And he says, wherefore is it that thou dost ask after my name? And he blessed him there. Have you ever wondered... Scripture only gives us what the writers could put together, right? What you reckon this divine being, what the Spirit of Prophecy calls the angel of the covenant who wrestled with Jacob, what you reckon this divine being answered Jacob in regards to his name, apart from what we know that's written in scriptures? Sorry? Nope. I am? Okay, so my sister said the devil. My brother says I am. What else do you think? What do you reckon this divine being who was wrestling with Jacob across the brook Jabbok and Jacob asks him his name and says, he says, wherefore dost thou ask me my name? And then he blessed him, right? Now the reason it couldn't be the Satan is because this divine being blessed Jacob. So that's how you can determine it. Come on, what else do you reckon? When Jacob asked him his name, he asked Jacob, he says, what's your name? Even though he knew Jacob's name, he had come out to specifically wrestle with this specific man. God. He says, God, okay, good. Christ. Christ. Whatever this angel answered Jacob and blessed him, and whatever other words which scripture has not recorded there, all I know is when I read verse 30, and Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen who face to face? God. I have seen God face to face. Wasn't that an amazing experience? Why would God come and wrestle with a young man like him, who had no purpose in life, except God had loved this man, and God had seen his circumstances. And he says, you know what? You were deceived to practice your deception, but I want to bless thee. And it wasn't just once. Angels appeared on to, in the vision. You know, when you read verse uh, chapter 32, 
verse 1, and it says, Jacob went on his way, and angels of God met him. And when Jacob saw them, he said, this is God's host, and he called the name of that place Mahanaim. Right? So here is Jacob constantly having these experiences with angels and with divine beings. Shows how God loved him. We call him the deceiver. But I say he was a special one. I say he was a special one. The angel wrestles with him. Now I need to turn around and ask you one more question before we go any further. If we turn around and track back to verse 11, 115, maybe five minutes I'll be finished, right? 115, now come on, quick, quick, quick. Chapter 11, let me hear pages turning. Chapter, sorry, verse 11 of Genesis chapter 32. I'm going to ask you these two questions and then we're going to close. I'm going to answer with scriptures as to what the answers are. It says, in verse 11, it says, Deliver me, I pray thee, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, lest he will come and smite me and the mother with the children. How many wives did Jacob have? Four by now? Okay. So why is it that scripture only puts the word down there that he says, lest he come and smite me and the mother with the children. So mother, singular, plural. Singular, right? Why is it Jacob says mother on its own? It's because he had four wives with him by then. At that point when he's crossing. So, but he mentions only one. He had a favorite wife, that's it. But how many wife, how many children did that favorite wife have at that instant when he was by the brook Jabbok? One. One which was Joseph, right? Because remember when Rachel gave birth to Benjamin, she died immediately after birth, right? So that means Benjamin still wasn't born. But why is it that he puts the word mother with children? Children plural, mother singular. He had a purpose. You know, Jacob was a clever man. Jacob, remember when I, one of the first statements I turned around and read to you, it says the promises made to Abraham and confirmed to his son were held by Isaac and Rebekah as the great object of the desires and hopes. For it included not only an inheritance of worldly wealth, but spiritual preeminence. He who received it was to be the priest of his family and in the line of his posterity, the redeemer of the world would come. Jacob knew this promise that the Messiah was to come through his lineage and guess what he tried to do to preserve his life he tried to hold God hostage did you know that because the wife who had the children was who who had the children in plural Leah, Leah right and who and, and in which child of Leah was the lineage of Christ to come Judah, Judah right so he turns around and pushes Leah with her children to the front. Because he's trying to hold God hostage. Because he's trying to say, you know something? Listen, I know you wouldn't let Esau strike those children. Because if he strikes those children, lineage gone. Redeemer is supposed to come in that line. But God was still good. So prophecy says that while this divine being was wrestling with uh, Esau, uh, with uh, Isaac across the brook, Another angel had been sent already to Esau to tell him not to come and be bad or to come in a violent manner to strike and fight against his brother, Jacob. I'm going to ask one more question. Let's go back. Sorry? Oh, sorry, I heard something. No? Okay. So, I will ask one more question and I promise we'll close after this. Amen? Right? So anytime I come around your house and I say I'll be leaving in five minutes, you know what that means, right? Okay, good. Don't invite me to your house. That's number one. And when he saw he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. Why did Jesus touch Jacob's thigh? And I wouldn't ask you. <laughs> you know the answer. <laughs> So 
Okay, so you would know. So you. So okay. What? What? Let me just. Uh, so. So he would. So we would know, or he would know. He would know. He would know. Okay, that it was God. Okay, my sister in the back. Have sympathy on him. Okay, that's cool. So one says because so that he would know it's God who was wrestling against him. Uh, my sister said so that Esau would have sympathy in. It would humble him. Okay. John? Reminder. A reminder. Okay, that's cool. Throughout his life and everything. But now, you know something? I have, so I asked the question, why did Jesus, or why did Christ strike Jacob's thigh? Now, if they were wrestling, what kind of wrestling was this? Freestyle? <laughs> so you could tie kickbox a little, you could throw punches, you could trip, right? You know, I, I asked myself this question, and it was only a couple of weeks ago that I found out the answer. Because I always thought, I said, hold on. Jesus is good at any kind of warfare, right? Amen? Amen. So Jesus could give you a knocking in the ring, boxing style, right? He could knock you out spiritually. He could martial arts all over you, right? Because he's quick, he's swift, he's light, right? And I kept thinking, I'm like, man, I says, if, if Jesus wanted, Jesus could have knocked him straight between the eyes and knock out Jacob and said, Jacob, fix yourself, man, stop wrestling with me. Was it that Jacob was so good at his blocks in the higher part of his body and the lower part between, on his uh, abdominal and thoracic area that Jesus couldn't swing a punch that could knock him? That Jesus was like, you know what, I'm going to have to resort to under tactics by hitting him in his hip. Oh, Jesus so good with his legs that he just flipped one and he hit Jacob right in the hips, in the thigh, and it knocked his thigh out of joint. No, it's none of those. Let's turn around and find out what a thigh represents in the Bible. And I'll turn around and explain to you why specifically on this side of the brook, Jesus had to touch his thigh. Are you ready? Yes. Okay. And I'll promise I'll be closing. Numbers chapter 5, sorry, Genesis chapter 24 verse 9. Let's quickly flip. Genesis chapter 24 verse 9. Those of you who are struggling with food, please wait. There'll be a plenty of food laid out. And by the grace of God, you'll be blessed. And we'll be closing shortly. Genesis chapter 24 verse 9. Genesis chapter 24, this is when Isaac and Rebekah turn around and take Isaac's servant and turn around and tell him to go and... Uh, sorry, uh, Abraham, sorry. Abraham was getting old and he wanted to send his most trusted servant to go and get a wife for Isaac. And he says, he says, go on to my people and find my son a wife. And Genesis chapter 24 verse 9, and when they had finished making the covenant and the agreement, it says, and the servant put his hand under what? The thigh of Abraham, his master, and swear to him concerning that matter. So just the way in society today, me and you could have an agreement, Paul, and we can shake hands on it. In the olden times, when you made a covenant with someone, you put your hand on your thigh, and they put their hand on your thigh as well. Right? Okay, so that's one instance. Genesis chapter 47, verse 29. Is everyone still with me? Genesis chapter 47, verse 29. And the time drew that Israel, or Jacob this time, right? Israel must die, and he called his son Joseph, and said unto him, If now I have found grace in thy sight, put thee, I pray thee, thy hand under my what? Thigh. My thigh. And deal kindly and truly with me. Bury me not, I pray thee, in Egypt. But I will lie with my fathers, and thou shalt carry me out of Egypt, and bury me in their burying place. And he said, I will do as thou said. And he said... Swear unto me, and he swear unto him, and Israel bowed himself upon the bed's head. So there again was thigh. Now those of you who want a third proof of the thigh being used as part of a covenant, you can mark it in your scriptures. It's found in the book of Nehemiah chapter 5 verse 13. This is when the elders within Israel were lending with interest and in taking people's sons and daughters as slaves in exchange for loans. And Nehemiah rebuked them, and in rebuking them, Everyone shook their thigh and said, we will no longer practice this practice. 
So when God was knocking his thigh, what was he doing? God was breaking the covenant of deception that Jacob had obtained. And God was trying to say, listen, I'm making a fresh new covenant with you, Jacob. And in blessing him and making that covenant, God turns around and blesses and he says, he says, for thou shalt be called no longer Jacob, but your name will be what? Israel. Saints, if you have something that's been pinned on you, a weight that weighs on you for the most of your life, that people have turned around and nicknamed you something, you know something? Forget the people and the nickname that you've been given. You turn around and wrestle with God and He will bless you. Amen. Thank you, Ricky, for the wonderful message today. We indeed make mistakes and we fail and we make bad decisions, but we have a great hope in Jesus Christ. If we repent, He forgives our sins and He changes us. He gives us a new life. Now we are uh, having the closing hymn, so if we all stand singing hymn number 590, Trust and Obey.
ye, but only trust and obey you. In all things, even when we see that your plans are going to be thwarted by man and his ways and his strength, help us, Lord, to realize that you are truly and the only one who's in control, Lord. There's no one else. And help us not to walk in the ways of Satan to try to accomplish your work in our ways, in our flesh, where it'll only bring us a curse and broken hips. Thanks. Bad covenants. I pray and I ask at this time in Jesus' name, Lord, please bless your people and truly let them be blessed. That your word, your work, and your truth may be proclaimed by us for the generation that we live in as time draws fast, close to an end. Open our minds and open our hearts. Wake us up, shake us up, break us up, and Lord, please also take the time to make us up. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Amen. Amen.